Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this. Uh, I have the, the great honor and privilege of trying to uh, explain uh, how we got to where we're at today in about 10 minutes. So uh, I'm gonna try to just jump into that uh, quickly and not do too much of what you could find on Wikipedia, but um, some of the, the more interesting notes at the start and then sort of build out how we got to this moment in time. I think something that people don't really know about Point Reyes is that the actual studies that were trying to figure out if this could be a national park were as early as 1935. They were conducted by Conrad Wirth, who actually became the uh, director of the Park Service later on when, when Point Reyes was actually established. Uh, he and a couple of other uh, great Marin uh, North Bay residents that worked for the Park Service conducted these first surveys and they remained uh, activists throughout the entirety of, of the creation of Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, but as you might know from other documentaries like Rebels with a Cause that talk about the development of the North Bay and the protection of the North Bay, uh, in the 50s, uh, we started to see more suburban sprawl from San Francisco. You started seeing uh, more beach houses, more subdivision being proposed around Point Reyes, including um, in 1956 and 1958. Some people don't realize, in addition to timber harvest and grazing, there's actually a mine out in West Marin uh, mm -hmm. as well in, in Bolinas. And uh, in 1959, Congressman Clem Miller, who you might have seen in the movie Rebels with a Cause, uh, he became a member of the House of Representatives and his, his big fight was to establish Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, and yet um, there was some opposition, I should say, before they actually established it. Uh, the ranching community out at Point Reyes, while they did establish a couple of small beaches for the public over time, uh, they did uh, for the first year or two actively lobby against the creation of Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, in 1961, they uh, you know, were flying every couple of months to Congress to testify against the creation of the National Seashore. The same with the Marine Board of Supervisors, as well as other groups in the area. Fortunately, uh, the Sierra Club, which was headed by David Brower at the time, worked to uh, turn the tide with a former Park Service employee, George Collins. Uh, in 1962, they ultimately did establish Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, to save and preserve for the purposes of public recreation, benefit, and inspiration, a portion of the diminishing seashore of the United States that remains undeveloped. This was for David Brower and for Harold Gilliam, who wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle, what they called an island in time. Uh, and there's a photo, you see David Brower down uh, at the right in that photo, um, looking down at JFK. Uh, and uh, right next to JFK is uh, Clem Miller as well. So in 1961, here was actually a proposed map from the time. And you'll see some of these things actually look the same. You'll see uh, that there is a ranching area on this 1961 map, as well as what, what, what used to be the, the Drake's Bay Oyster Farm. Uh, and the reason that this ranching area exists uh, existed is because it was difficult for them to figure out how to fundraise to create the entire National Seashore. Originally, it was 35,000 acres uh, surrounded this pastoral area, and they were thinking of more of this donut and a whole model because they didn't have enough money to actually acquire all of these ranches. But uh, over this period of time, uh, they ended up coming up with a number of, of different mechanisms to acquire the ranches. So that the original amount of money was about 14.5, 14.4 million dollars to acquire that outer perimeter and Bear Valley. But then prices rose as speculators started acquiring more uh, parcels out there and asking for the ranchers to sell their land. Uh, some legislation was actually proposed by a New York Senator uh, and passed that the folks out there could not sell their land to a private developer. They had to sell it to the federal government. Um, and uh, in 1970, they actually were able to increase the acquisition ceiling of the land to $57.5 million to purchase all of the ranches and create the entirety of Point Reyes National Seashore, over 70,000 acres. Uh, that in today is about 
uh, $380 million in today's dollars adjusted for inflation. Uh, most of the ranches, uh, which you see here on the left, the, the alphabet, the old Shafter era ranches that were all sectioned off, uh, they, through negotiation, retained the rights of use and occupancy uh, for historical ranching purposes. These these historic leases went until 1991, and in, and in two cases, it went until 2005. Uh, the residential properties within the boundary were handled differently. There are still some actual residential and other types of properties that exist within the designated boundary of Point Reyes. Uh, and this leaseback model to purchase these ranches and then lease it back, uh, that was a practice that was used elsewhere in the National Park Service. That wasn't uncommon in order to acquire these properties and eventually retire those leases. Uh, we've seen this happen elsewhere, including Channel Island National, uh, National Park, mm -hmm. which is, uh, there used to be ranching there, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Grand Tetons National Park. They also had historic districts that still remain on the, the registrar of historic places, and they're also managed as cultural resources despite retiring the actual uh, industrial agricultural practices. Um, so getting to the next piece, um, you know, around uh, 1987, some of those leases ended up changing from these like temporary or like 25 year leases to uh, more formalized five-year special use permits for the continuation of agriculture. And, and the rationale for the Park Service was during that 25-year per period time, they actually weren't able to really enforce some environmental regulations that were still being created, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, et cetera. And so creating a new special use permit process to, to lease out land for ranching actually allowed them to, in their mind, enforce uh, some of the environmental regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And so you started to see that transition happening before 1991, around 1987. And so those types of leases, those five-year lease permits have been used until today. Um, and today there are 24 ranches that exist, uh, 24 ranching families that have leases at the park. Some are, are families that have married together and others are, are business partners that share the same lease and maybe they run their cattle at different times of year on the same land. Uh, the one exception is D Ranch, which uh, was retired and now they've ended up leasing it to other families out there. Um, and, then, and then another is this oyster farm that existed in Drake's Estero, which is the only marine wilderness, uh, marine protected area, um, on the west coast actually and this was a potential wilderness area back in the day and they ended up um you know allowing for uh this lease to retire after 40 years so it could become an official wilderness and that created some issues with the farm local farm to table movement and i'm sure a lot of you are aware of that you can find a lot online uh, we can talk about that in the q a too but in in 2014 uh 2015 the park service denounced 250 elk died during the, the drought from 2012 to 2014. And this led some environmentalists to investigate, including myself. I was brought out here to research this and we found that that was just the tip of the iceberg from lack of lease enforcement to severe water and air contamination to actual signage that was put up to bar the public from accessing public trailheads and other things uh, that ranchers were also using or leasing from the American people. Uh, we continued to press a little further. And you know, this is, when I first came out here, this was the scene of I Ranch, one of the, the dairy ranches that had silage mowing out here. And that silage mowing created, you know, for example, beyond elk, uh, abundance of ravens that were uh, consuming all the birds that were mowed up in this silage that occurs on a, about 1200 acres of Point Reyes. And uh, you know, that today, there are myriad impacts beyond the elk, beyond those birds that are in the silage fields, even in the uh, threatened snowy plover. You see here this headline from the Park Service this spring, unfortunately, about 68% of the, uh, the failed, so 62% had failed of the snowy plover nests, 68% of those failed because of raven predation, because there's an overabundance of ravens. So that's just one example, and we have plenty we could talk about today. But um, the, these, we started to see these issues and 
resource renewal and Western watersheds, uh, we filed a lawsuit with the Center of Biological Diversity against the National Park Service to challenge the, the process and the management of Point Reyes National Seashore and really look at the environmental impacts. They had never done an environmental review. And we ended up winning that process over the course of a, about 15 months. And we're, we entered into this current process that we're in, where there is a, a comment period and a, a NEPA process, a national environment, uh, environmental policy process to review ranching at Point Reyes National Seashore. Here are some of the alternatives. You don't have to read through them, but this is just an example of sort of what this process looks like and how people can weigh in on it. So you see alternative A is leaving things relatively the same, whereas alternative B is the expansion of ranching, adding more diverse uses for agriculture, uh, creating ranch cores where they can have bed and breakfasts and farm tours and artichoke crops and stuff like that. So this is actually being proposed right now on your national seashore. Um, and here's, there are three other alternatives, D, E, and F, should be, you know, decreasing the amount of ranching, uh, closing all dairying out at the seashore, as well as just retiring all the leases over five years and restoring the national seashore uh, for wildlife and, and wilderness, et cetera. And, you know, uh, I was asked to mention Congressman Huffman, but he also uh, jumped in during this comment period and <laughs> actually filed legislation um, to essentially direct the Park Service to to continue to authorize ranching and dairying out at Point Reyes, to manage the elk, whether that included sending them to tribal lands or outright hunting them. Um, uh, and the other final piece is he directed the Park Service to issue 20 year leases. Now, this was sort of un uncalled for in the middle of a public planning process where the American people are asked to weigh in. And it goes to show how some politicians are sort of tipping their you know, putting their hand on the scale and trying to get certain outcomes. And so it's hard for Park Service employees to operate, you know, clear in a clear mindset when they know that politicians are actively trying to change the legislation in the middle of these public comment periods that we're in. Fortunately, despite the fact that the House uh, approved this legislation that Jared Huffman proposed and the Trump administration signaled support for it as well, it did die in the Senate. Um, that doesn't mean it can't come back and we remain, you know, cognizant of the fact that this could come back, but this is like happening real time, you know, over the last couple of years during this comment process that came out of the litigation. And just recently you might've seen in a, a, the SF Chronicle or the Marin IJ, uh, that, um, Resource Renewal Institute and some volunteers actually conducted a study of the po public comments that were submitted by maybe some of you on this call, uh, some of our organizations, you know, submitting comments saying, you know, what we thought of their different alternatives. And it turns out that about 91.4% uh, of the people who submitted comments to the Park Service were actually opposed or were against ranching on the seashore, which was the first time that, you know, this type of statistic has actually been put out there from the public comment process. And it kind of pushes back against these conceptions that are perpetuated by Jared Huffman and others that everybody wants ranching, the expansion of agriculture out at the National Seashore. And, uh, you know, this is the most up-to-date kind of stuff that we're working with. Um, but I, you know, I just wanted to bring you all up to speed to where we're at so we can have sort of a full discussion about this. Um, and I think that that's about my time. This is going to be sort of an ecological history of the Point Reyes area um, based on a bunch of field trips I did. But the main point is the Park Service, one of their legal mandates is to not impair the natural resources of the seashore. And you'll see that that's exactly what they're doing. So I'm sort of a grassland expert, been studying this for 30 years. And this is a painting I did of what a coastal prairie used to look like 500 years ago. This is actually San Francisco as it appeared hundreds of years ago with perennial bunch grasses, clean air, clean water. Another painting I did, this is um, herds of tule elk, pronghorn antelope. This is what um, Point Reyes used to look like. And of course we had California grizzlies which are extinct. But 
when you go onto the seashore, you mostly see these heavily degraded cattle pastures, except once in a while you'll discover like a beautiful example of that exact native prairie. And this is one that's, um, I'm not even going to say where it is. It, it, it's not even protected. It's just on an outer corner of a dairy where the cows don't get to, so it's just not grazed. But it's full of wildflowers. And look at that ground. Just kind of memorize this as we go on into the grazed areas. These are deep-rooted native perennial bunch grasses with wildflowers. This is um, Idaho fescue. But there are others. This is a Pacific reed grass, giant bunches. This is almost like hip high. But when you get down on your hands and knees, you start seeing something called biological soil crust, which is mosses, lichens, this um, fruticose lichen. It's like a miniature rainforest that collects moisture from the fog. Here's little cup-shaped lichens. So this is what the prairie should look like all over the open spaces of the park. Just um, spongy ground, and it just cannot handle a 1,200-pound cow crushing it, um, having manure. So I did these sketches to try to show you what's going on underground. So here's our native thousands of years ago prairie that's relict, and you can see the native perennial bunch grasses have deep roots. And all this network here, that is the filaments of mycorrhizal fungi, um, the roots of the moss, roots of forbs, roots of the lichens, and blue-green algae. So this forms like a net of living substance deep into the soil, and it stores carbon. This is actually a, a carbon sequestration grassland. So what happens when you have cows come, cows are heavy, they're fenced in, herded together, and they just trample and crush the above ground plant material. And then so everything below ground starts dying. So this is actually what you result in, and this is all over California, but in Point Reyes National Seashore, it's sad to see that most of the pastoral zone is this. Um, manure, there's weeds from Europe, a lot of Eura Eurasian um, annual grasses that have very short roots, and all the biological soil crust is gone. So you have a dead soil. This does not store carbon. And here's an example. This is um, a feedlot on an organic dairy on Point Reyes National Seashore. Now this may, whoops, this may look really pretty in spring, winter, but this is actually fields of invasive weeds. Here's a dairy, I think this is El Ranch, and this is um, blooming mustard from Europe that they grow, they actually plant this to feed the dairy cows. This is um, wild radish, which they also plant in this field, and the seeds actually get out and invade other um, parts of the park. So in the late summer, it just starts to look like this, hammered, there's bare soil, cow trails, manure. There's absolutely no native plants in here, and this is not sequestering carbon, but it's all often called carbon farming, and this is sort of a myth. So in some of the recent field trips, it was kind of fun to compare the cattle grazed areas and the tule elk areas. So this is um, Tamales Point. And this is actually one of the free roaming herds near Drake's Bay, Drake's Beach. And this one, actually, these elk have the bullseye target on them because they're competing with these dairy cows. And you can just see that the tule elk, these are not actually to scale, but tule elk, I mean, they weigh something like 400 to 700 pounds. And these dairy cows and even beef cows are you know, a thousand pound or more. I think bulls weigh at 2,000 pounds at times. So there's just a big difference. So here's that, back to that native coastal prairie remnant. This is an Idaho fescue with deep roots, spongy um, soil, there's no bare soil. And then this is the pastoral zone in one of the ranches, dairy ranch. Um, and you can just see there's a lot of bare soil and these are the annuals from Europe. Here's a typical dairy cow hoof print, a lot of bare ground. 
And we happened to find an elk that went through that coastal prairie remnant. Um, and last time I went there, I was really impressed to see that elk have been wandering all over um, right in the pastoral zone. Here are elk pellets compared with cow manure, quite a difference. But this is something that um, it is sort of a myth that this is carbon farming and regenerative ranching. This is an organic dairy along Kehoe Creek and it's an industrial modern facility. Oftentimes you'll see cows pooping and peeing right into the water bodies. They do this so much that this is actually a pond that is covered with um, being aquatic plants and it's called a eutrophified water body because there's just so much nutrient input, nitrogen from all the manure. Again, here's Kehoe Creek. And I grew up in the East Bay in the Berkeley area. I've been going to Point Reyes National Seashore since the 80s. And I just didn't know this was happening at Point Reyes. So this is Kehoe Creek. And that dairy I had in the picture before, right next to it, they wash a lot of liquefied manure out of the dairy barns into these holding ponds and then they suck up the liquefied manure into trucks and then spread it on the seashore lands. This is public lands because there's so much dairy manure they just can't figure out how to get rid of it. So this is carbon farming. You actually are dumping liquefied manure onto pastures or trying to fertilize those silage fields. Sometimes they dump dry manure. This is a picture someone took of a sprinkler um, sprinkling uh, liquefied manure on a basically a weedy grassland. So this is a far cry from our native coastal prairies. And all this cattle grazing and manure and water pollution affects a lot of rare animals and plants that inhabit the seashore. The seashore is a hot spot for biodiversity. So here's another painting I did of, this is actually Lagunitas Creek, thousand years ago, a mother grizzly and cubs are feeding on coho salmon, which still run in this creek, but coho salmon have been reduced so much that they're now federally endangered, threatened, um, because they've, they're almost gone. So here is habitat that the Park Service is trying to restore for coho salmon, our federally threatened coho salmon. Um, this is actually in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, part of the pastoral zone on a beef ranch. This is another beef ranch um, on Point Reyes National Seashore. But you can see all the deep rooted perennial bunch grasses have been long ago grazed and trampled out. And what you have are these short, rooted annual grasses and just it starts eroding. You get massive soil loss and this is massively eroding away into the ocean and it's harming a lot of aquatic life including steelhead trout and the salmon. So conservation grazing is actually a term thrown around a lot in, even in the Bay Area where parks and preserves are trying to use cattle grazing to somehow say they are conserving native habitats and animals. And I could go into more detail on this, but it's just not. I mean, to go back here, you see barbed wire, the elk get tangled in these barbed wire fences when they try to jump pasture fences. Um, this is alfalfa hay trucked in to the seashore to feed all these hungry dairy cows. So how do we want our national park units managed as beef ranches, dairies, which they're abundant all over California on private lands? Or do we want a true national park, a beautiful seashore restored to coastal prairies and native wildlife? If you're listening to this broadcast and you have this Zoom meeting and you don't really know what a tule elk is, you've seen some pictures, don't feel bad because when I was a graduate student at San Jose State, I had to pick up something from my work. And so I went in to meet with Dr. Kudelek and he said, um, Julie, you have to do a thesis. And I said, okay, well, what should I do? And he goes, well, I wondered if you wanted to study elk. And I said, what's an elk? 
I had never heard of an elk, and I'd, I was born and raised in California. I'd never heard that we had these native tule elk. And so I began this journey of studying um, an animal that was on the brink of extinction at earlier in earlier times. So if you don't know about tule elk, don't be surprised because it's probably one of the best kept secrets in the state. And so my job today is to kind of share with you some of the cool things. California is a biodiversity hotspot, as we all know. It's one of the 25 world hotspots. And California is the only state that has its own subspecies of North American elk, which is pretty cool, the tule elk. So originally there were six subspecies of elk found, eastern elk and so on. A couple of those are now extinct, but there's now four supposedly subspecies left. There's Cervus canadensis, the species. And Cervus canadensis nanoides is the tule elk. And again, it's a California endemic. So California, I mean, that's really cool in itself that we have our own subspecies of North American elk. How many of you knew that before now? Mm -hmm. I didn't. So, I mean, it took me a while to learn that. So it's, California is really a special place. Originally, there were 500,000 tule elk. So if you can picture the state of California, the tule elk went as far north as Mount Shasta, along the foothills of the Sierra to the east, up into the foothills. They loved the oak savanna, oak woodlands, grasslands. And then down into the Bakersfield, Buena Vista areas, as far south as they go, all the way over to the coastal areas. They don't like the heavily forested areas. They like open grasslands, coastal prairies, as Laura did such an excellent job on. And again, they love the oak savannas, and they're pretty cool in that sense. Um, so as early settlers came to California, um, the elk were hunted extensively for their meat, fur, and lard. And by the 1870s, early 1870s, it was thought the tule elk were extinct. And then kind of a hero found, by the name of Henry Miller found a small group of tule elk on his property, and he ordered, he was a rancher, and he orders ranch hands to protect the elk with guns, which they did. And so we figure from all we can get from the historical records, there might have been maybe 20 elk left. So if you think about that, they went from 500,000 to 20 elk, which is kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now we have 5,700, 5,700. So we have about 1% of the original population. And as a biologist, I just kind of drew this one for you because I was trying not to do I don't know if can you guys see that, but just to see this whole concept of a population bottleneck is kind of important. So the elk went from 500,000 down to less than 20, went to this bottleneck. And so the concern is now there's 5,700, again, about 1% of the original. The real concern is their genetic health. Can this subspecies North American elk adapt to changes in the environment? And things would be like climate change and other concerns, changes in the environment. And again, there isn't a lot of movement between the elk. Again, as I mentioned, there's 5,700 among 25 different herds. Some of those herds have actually disappeared. They're hard to find the elk at some of the herds. So it's a trend that's happening both on private and public lands. Um, tule elk, as Laura just did an amazing job too, talking about the tule elk co-evolved with the native perennial bunch grasses, the native oak woodlands. They're a grazer and a browser, so they feed on grasses, and they also feed on shrubs. So they're again, they're a grazer and browser. Um, and again, in areas, we found some areas in the last few years where the, the cattle have been removed, we're seeing the native landscape restore if there's native elk. The native elk are helping in the restoration we saw it on state park lands, which is pretty incredible. We were so excited. All the perennial bunch grasses were coming back. All the native blue oaks were coming back. They're regenerating in that, in that habitat, again, with cattle been removed in the early 90s. One of the important reintroduction sites was Point Reyes. So elk, as the numbers expanded and Miller protected them, the elk were reintroduced into their native habitat. And that's a really important concept, concept of reintroduction. The elk were restored into native habitat. They were also introduced into places that are not part of their native habitat. Owens Valley would be an example of that. There's several hundred elk at Owens Valley that's not their native habitat. So Point Reyes is the only national park that has tule elk. Isn't that really cool? Point Reyes is part of the national park system, even though it's called a national seashore, it confuses people. And there are three categories of federal lands. These national parks are part of what are called restricted use lands. They're the most protected lands on earth. And that's a really important concept. So we have BLM lands that are moderately restricted. We have you know, and multiple use lands like the Forest Service, but the National Park Service is the most protected lands on earth. And that's an important concept because it puts it to that high threshold. Um, and again, the mission of a national park is the concept that we leave these lands unimpaired for present and future generations. So as other people have mentioned, there's three herds of tule elk, and isn't this really cool? I love this little map. And this shows you Point Reyes National Seashore, and at the top is the captive herd. So that's the tallest point elk reserve, and that's where the elk um, are captive. They can't get out, and uh, so they're captive. 
and that herd number is about 432. So according to the National Park Service at Point Reyes, there's 732 Leopa Point Reyes. And again, divide among three herds, the captive herd, and there's a limitor herd, the number's about, what was my number on that? 174 elk, and again, this is by the Point Reyes staff. So it's 174 and it's free roaming. And then there's 124 in the Drake's Beach area. And apparently these guys swam over to get over to the Drake's Beach area. So those are free roaming elk herds. And this is where a lot of the conflict, as others have said so well, Chance and Skyler and others have done such a good job of just saying this is where the kind of the conflict has occurred. Um, so again, those three herds. And I just wanted to mention that I think one of the things we started getting involved in this original scoping meetings in 2014, 2015, and one of the things that was really troubling is during the drought of 2014 to 16, about 250 elk that were heard, heard that were captive died because of lack of fresh water. And that's when I really started to get fired up. I go, this is the worst. I've seen some pretty terrible things. I've picked up a lot of dead elk. I've had my job of working for Fish and Game as a I hired as a biologist working um, under contract with them to the university was to find the dead elk. So if elk got tangled up in the barbed wire, my job was to kind of find them after they were dead. They got shot, which a lot of elk did. My job is to take the bullets out of their brain. Not a single case was ever prosecuted. And so when I heard this thing that these elk were not allowed access to fresh water, it takes a long time to die from that. How, how could the National Park Service do that? To me, that is a really clear message of the pressure that they're under, that you'd let that many elk die that slowly. I mean, that has been horrible. So again, I just think that's something we should kind of keep in the back of mind. One last thing I want to mention about that is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFG, which was usually Fish and Game. They had the legal responsibility to oversee the Tule elk. And so I went to them and said, what did you think about this at Point Reyes? And what do you think about their... And there was no interest at all. And I think that's something that people should really talk about, that they should get their local, local uh, state officials involved in. So under the California Department of Natural Resources is California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Fish and Game, again, has that legal responsibility. But... When you talk to Joe Hobbs, who is the Tule Elk State Coordinator, and you ask about these things, he said, well, you know, Julie, Tule Elk are a moneymaker for the state. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, hunting them, it's a moneymaker. And I said, really? You don't care about the long-term preservation? Because, you know, Joe, we may not have Tule Elk. And that's something that's a really important thing we have to carry on. We're not guaranteed that these elk are going to be around for a long period of time. Also, we participate in the general land management plan that was so well covered before. And from my perspective as a scientist, it's extremely flawed. It's not from a scientific base or perspective. It's very biased, and it's really a political perspective. Those ranchers were really aggressive in those scoping meetings. I mean, I'd never seen anything quite like it. And I've, I got attacked in the field one time, so I've, I've been out seeing how, not point raised, but in other areas. It is crazy what goes on. And the elk seem to bring out this kind of anger in people that is really something. And you're kind of seeing it coming to a point here at Point Reyes, but I just believe when I met people like Diana and others and Diane, and just Laura and these wonderful people that there's a lot of people that are going to rise up and say, we're not going to put up with this. And Skyler and others have done such a fabulous job on this as well. And again, these ranchers, they had their time, 1962 to 1987. They were paid, as was mentioned, um, $300 million. And it's time for them to move out of a national park. So all the citizens of California need to rise up. And I just want to finish with this concept of the public trust doctrine. Tule elk are protected by what's called the public trust doctrine. According to the public trust doctrine, Tule elk and all wildlife are protected on both public and private lands for present and future generations as an integral component of the native landscape. Tule elk cannot be chased, harassed, killed, or injured on public or private lands, and hunting is only allowed under California state game laws. All citizens have a moral and ethical responsibility to protect all of our native Tule elk at Point Reyes. And with that, I will pass that on. Thank you very much. So we got to get fired up. And one last thing, there should be 60 to 90,000 Tule up in California. So if it has a simple growth rate of maybe two to 3%, we should have 60 to 90,000. If anybody told me when I started studying the elk in the 1980s that in 2020, there'd be 5,700 elk, I wouldn't have believed it. So if they're not safe at point raise, they're in trouble and we need your help. Thank you. I title this The Awakening Process because 
It was quite a journey of discovery and a lot of information to try to ingest and process. And the catalyst of this journey of discovery was the calves. But it's very possible that the journey wouldn't have ever even started if a different journey hadn't also been underway. One in which I had been researching my food sources and slowly you know, gaining an awareness of the reality of some of my choices. Now, the goal is not to say what anyone should or should not eat, but it's overwhelmingly common for most of us to have a huge disconnection between our food and the reality of that food source. If through research, I hadn't recently seen what a veal pin looks like or what a dairy calf isolation pin looks like, I probably would have dismissed those random objects on the side of the road as something I didn't recognize and therefore didn't think about again. But now there was visual recognition, which led me to suspect, which led me to investigate, which allowed me to know. Acknowledging the presence of the calves woke me up to acknowledging the presence of all the adult cows, and there are a lot of them. Of course I'd seen them, but I wasn't really thinking about them. This time it wasn't a case of disconnection so much as a case of conditional norms. Meaning, seeing the cows in Point Reyes didn't present something visually new, it was a continuation of what I'd already been seeing. Cows are everywhere in California, especially your drive out to Point Reyes National Seashore. But learning that the elk were going to be shot because of the cattle not only woke me up to how many cattle were there, but to the fact that I was in a national park unit. And killing wildlife there for cows sounded a little weird, at least to me. So then you start the long journey of trying to understand the complicated history of the seashore and what dairies are doing in a national seashore in the first place. And along the way, you start to hear the standard justifications that have been preached and promoted for so long that now your average Joe repeats them as fact whether he or she actually knows anything about Point Reyes or not. Such as... The ranchers are actually good for the wildlife and habitat. The seashore wouldn't even exist without the ranchers. The ranchers worked hand in hand in the creation of the seashore. The legislation always intended the ranchers to stay. The ranches are crucial to the local economy and necessary for food. None of which turn out to be true. Next come the arguments using your buzzwords about sustainability and local and family and the importance of grazing and the benefits to the park by the very presence of the ranches. Now, in order to actually refute any of these claims or agree with any of these claims, it behooves one to actually learn about these topics. Therefore, I had to start learning more about plants and about wildlife and about ecology in general. This led to another form of awakening because when I look out over a landscape, I no longer just saw green and categorized everything generically into plants. I then began to recognize different plants. Native plants, invasive plants, perennial plants, annual plants. What plants played what role? And not only that, but the importance that different plants hold for different animals within the seashore. Eventually you learn that the low-cut, golf course-looking areas symbolize a lack of biodiversity, a lack of habitat, a lack of native plants, and the dominant presence of invasive plants. This is affectionately referred to as the pastoral zone, but the pastoral zone is not habitat. It is the graveyard of former habitat. And then you realize that you've been driving past these habitat graveyards while praising them for as long as you can remember. I can still hear myself. So happy not to see apartment buildings and high-rises. Ooh, I can't wait to show my family and friends Sonoma's green rolling hills. Completely devoid of wildlife. I'm talking about the green rolling hills throughout Sonoma, throughout Marin, throughout other counties surrounding the Bay Area. Because when you look out there, once again, you're not looking at biodiverse habitat. You aren't looking at elk and antelope and wolves and other animals running around out there. You're not seeing any of that. But if you do look closely, you'll see cattle grazing. And that's irregardless of whether it is private land or public land. That's why these hills mirror the pastoral zones out in Point Reyes. It's not wild habitat. It's grazing land. California has been converted from wild to agricultural, even where we didn't mean to, because all of those brown plants that turn into fire fodder before anything else are invasive annuals introduced 
to California. Strangely enough, the land in Point Reyes looks even worse than grazed lands outside of Point Reyes. These are the ghetto golf courses. Land that is shockingly degraded for anywhere, not just for being within a national park unit. But despite that, and despite their own studies, we have a park service and even conservation groups saying things like Point Reyes is a model for how farming and wildlife can coexist. You hear that what we need is not less cows, but more cows. That agricultural livestock are what we need to stop the spread of agricultural livestock plants. That to fight the carbon emissions from the cows, we don't need less cow poop. The state needs to give financial incentives to the ranchers to produce even more poop. So finally, we circle back to the beginning, the calves. Because every negativity listed in this presentation, every issue, every challenge facing Mother Nature points back to the industry that at its core engages in an activity that by itself should be enough for us to say no. But our attachments to what we know, what we're comfortable with, what we were raised to think, traditions and cultures outweigh the quest for the greater good. Thus, I end this presentation with a question. On the journey of believing what we want to believe, which came first? That the source of the problem is the solution to the problem? Or that babies don't need their mothers and mothers don't want their babies? I remember waking up in a tent and it had rained all night. And I, I unzipped the tent and I went outside and I looked up at this huge Douglas fir tree and I just saw lichen hanging from the tree and it was misting and jeweled with the morning dew. And I had just never seen a tree like that before. I had just moved to the Bay Area from Chicago. I grew up in Detroit and I just moved here and I'd never been camping in my whole life. And I, I'd never seen trees like that before. And I, I could hear the ocean and I could hear the birds, but it was the greens that just mystified me. And I, I remember clearly the feeling in my body when I exhaled, it felt like, like years of stress had just melted away. And I fell in love with Point Reyes National Seashore right there. And I know you've all experienced that before. Most of you have been to Point Reyes. It's a jewel. It is a gem on the coast and it's so full of life. It's literally magic. And I knew that I needed to go back over and over. So long story short, I started volunteering at the park and I created my own volunteer program. I'm a full-time yoga teacher, so I created a yoga and dune restoration program where I would go and take groups of people into a gorgeous coastal dune ecosystem and we would remove invasive plants and we protected four endangered species. And at the end of the day, we would do yoga and picnic and it was beautiful. And after years of doing this, I saw just dozens of wildflowers come back that I've never even heard of before. And it was just one of those programs that I felt from start to finish proud of. And it was my favorite thing to do. And I, when I was out there, um, I kind of heard that the, the National Park Service was going to kill these elk. And I, I just thought, no, that just makes no sense. That why, they actually had given me Volunteer of the Year Award in 2018 for my work restoring wildlife. So for, for me to hear that they would be killing wildlife just made no sense. So I looked into it and I heard what you all just heard from Laura and Julie and Chance. And it was true. The park was going to kill elk. So let me just zoom out for a little bit because this is not just about the elk. Um, it's not just about the elk. It's about ecosystems. And when I zoom out, I'm going to remind us of the climate catastrophe that we are currently in. The United Nations report that came out last May, it says that nature is declining at unprecedented rates, that species extinction is accelerating, and that actually uh, one million species are at risk of extinction. It also said that more than a third of the entire world's land surface and 75% of fresh water is given and devoted to crop and livestock production. 
So while it's easy to see certain things like, okay, we don't cut down the rainforest, that's a no-brainer. Don't drill in the Arctic, that's a no-brainer. I'm gonna just zoom back in at Point Reyes because this is also a no-brainer. Um, what is happening at Point Reyes mirrors the exact global catastrophe that we are in right now. So zooming back in, I founded 4elk.org. And I saw this window of opportunity because in the, in the parks plan that you heard Chance talk about earlier, there's one alternative where you actually, there's an opportunity to phase out the destructive industry and restore the grasslands. So I founded 4elk.org and it was really just an organic process. Um, basically, I got informed, which is what you are all doing right now. And I started to talk to as many people as I could. I did outreach at farmers markets, at grocery stores, um, at festivals. I got to speak in universities. I got to speak in elementary schools. I started an online petition. I got letters written. Um, and then I started to notice that the local leaders are not listening to all of us. So I started organizing protests and demonstrations at Point Reyes National Seashore, at the town hall meetings, and also at the National Park Service headquarters. And at the beginning of the Four Elk campaign, I, I posted something on my social media, something like, save the elk. Um, and the National Park Service came to me. And they said that they saw my post and that they actually needed me to delete all reference of my volunteering at the park from my social media so that they don't seem biased. And if I don't delete all, all reference of volunteering from my social media, that I would actually not be able to volunteer with them anymore. That's right, the National Park uh, who once awarded me for protecting wildlife is now threatening to ban me from volunteering for speaking out about protecting wildlife. So that means I could not take you out to the dunes to learn about the plants and remove invasive species. I couldn't do it. So I, of course, the, you know, the National Park, they have no right to censor my personal speech and my personal social media, so I did not agree and they banned me from volunteering. The National Park does not have the park's best interest in mind. It doesn't. Um, it has the ranching interest in mind. Before all this, I might have thought, well, it's a national park and the park, is the, the staff is there all the time, so whatever they decide is probably in the best interest of the park, I'll defer to them. That is not true. They have the ranching interest in mind, not the wildlife. Two, we have the numbers. Uh, the public process, all the comments got published uh, recently, and there was 7,627 comments. 91% oppose ranching in the National Seashore. That does not even include the 700 comments they conveniently disqualified from my organization on a technicality. They completely disqualified those 700 comments, didn't count them. So 91% oppose ranching, only 2% of the comments uh, support the park's plan. So we have the numbers. So number three, we know what happens if we don't do anything. Well, what's gonna happen is that the park's gonna publish their final plan, they will hand ranchers 20 more, 20 year leases, and they will kill the elk. That's gonna happen, we know that. What I'm interested in learning is I want to know what's going to happen if we all speak up. What's going to happen if we actually demand that the Par National Park Service do its job? That we say, absolutely not, not in our park. Not, do not kill our elk. Do not kill the wildlife or the grasslands. Absolutely not. That, that's what I want to know is, is what if everybody speaks up? So what I hope to encourage is that all of us to get very vocal because you do not need to be a scientist. You do not need to be a biologist. You do not need to be an expert. You have to love the park and you have to love the ecosystems and you have to speak up. That's all you have to do. We have the science. We have the data. 
We just need a mass outcry of people talking, talking relentlessly, and talking very loudly. So that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm.